Um, you know what? During the prelude, hmm, I don't know. I think I would go and onto Michael, onto the musician. But where you're at right now is fine too. It's wherever you feel called to be. That's where we ask. So, well done.
divine God of all, come, my presence, my individual spirit be with you now. For I ache to hear your voice in every moment of every day. I yearn to hear the teachings of your Son, our Christ. I crave to hear the chorus of those who are called together through your Holy Spirit. Therefore, I pray, call me, O God. Call us all into your presence, so we may witness what you are calling each of us to do along the way to your divine kingdom. Please be seated. The world this week tells us once again how much need there is for the light of Christ, the peace that that light brings us. So let us welcome that light into our lives once again. Yeah. 
very special. So on January 19th, <coughs> I've been out of church a long time, so this is going to be the long guys. You might want to go get your spring outfits. <coughs> Four days later, I got diagnosed with AFib. Now I've got the majority of people that are over 70 probably have that. It's not uncommon, but it's scary as shit. <laughs> Sitting here, and you can feel the eye. <coughs> and then, so at any rate, I'm on meds for that. I'll see a hot dog the next week, and I too am mortal. But uh, I haven't been to church for a long time, and it's just been the complexities of my own life. It has nothing to do with this lovely, wonderful church family or the minister or anything of that nature. I will say 9 o'clock is really funny, guys, but that's my problem. <laughs> now, a joy beyond belief. You thought I was done? You better get your fall clothes out now. <laughs> I've been gone a long time, you know. Did you notice? A little bit, Gene. A little bit. <laughs> I said I noticed a little bit that you were gone. <laughs> Did you see that, that much? Can we have a conversation right now? <laughs> a joy beyond belief for me and my family is, of course, what you know about Brenda. The miracle that saved her. I spent at least five hours with she and Rosie the doll and her husband on Thursday. That woman, she's like a sister to She's 71, I'm 78. I mean, we grew up next door like little children together. She's one of the wisest people that I know on this earth now. I poured my heart out to her like I haven't to anyone and never had to her before. And she gave me back such wonderful, wonderful words of love. Honest to God, what a blessing, God, for saving that woman and letting her share. She's writing a song called Hope. Um, and if church goes over by a half an hour today, don't blame the minister. We miss you, Jimmy. I'd like prayers for my friend Linda, who was just diagnosed with cancer. God, please hear these prayers. <coughs> Well, I'm going to try and hurry it up a little. <laughs> <laughs> I have the greatest joy today to have with me the great Mr. Downey. Now, I know you know another Mr. Downey. And he hasn't um, aged this much. <laughs> but this is Robert Downey. It is Eddie's brother. Today is his 90th birthday. Actually, he's 100, but he only looks 90. <laughs> he lives right across the road from us. And I don't know, 25 years ago, I don't know if it was that, more maybe, um, they bought land that was um, their dad's and built a house there and our family grew in a most special way. And, okay, just one more. When we walked in, it's the same thing Eddie's father would have said, is I own one of those pews, you know. <laughs> and Robert said, we're gonna sit in it today. <laughs> but the other thing was, is that he remembers singing in this choir. Now, I will never be able to say that, but thank you for listening. I went as fast as I could. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Robert. Happy birthday to you. Um, I'd ask for prayers for Ben. Is is coming along fairly well, but as the time to get back to work draws nearer, he's becoming increasingly anxious about that and how it will go. And also prayer 
prayers for one of his best friends, Jamie, um, for his family. His mom uh, has uh, breast cancer, but she was also recently diagnosed with a terminal lung disease. And the two prohibit treatment for each other. So they're struggling with that this week. And, and they live in Florida, so he's um, feeling kind of lonely right now. Ben's going to be going up to spend some time with him. But Jamie's family. We have a prayer for Jen Howley, who's recover, recovering from a double vasectomy as well today. And I'd like to offer my own prayers for those of you that may not know. My father-in-law, Howley, is dying from cancer. He was given two weeks. It reminds me how precious every moment is. Every, every moment. Enjoy them. Celebrate them. God, please take Howdy's pain away as you call him home. Allow his family to enjoy your life. Keep you up giving them together. We have a prayer and a joy that was whispered to me. Because it should be shouted. And that's for our life. Yes. yes. Praise God. Thank you. Let us continue our prayer. God, thank you for the joyful blessings you bring into our lives, for healing our wounds, and for hearing our prayers, even those which we are not yet ready to receive. Thank you, O blessed God, thank you. May all glory be given to you forever and ever, for it is in you and you alone that we wholly pray. Let us seal this prayer with the prayer which Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And God bless whoever speaks. Children, yeah. and boys and girls, would you care to join Miss Susan and myself downstairs for some <coughs> songs and games today? So we do have three Bible readings today, and that sounds ominous, but they're all very short. So our first reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapters 9, verses 19 through 22. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I am myself not under the law, so that I may win those who are under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law so that I may win those who are outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I may by all means save some. May we join each other in voice as we sing Gloria, Gloria.
second Bible reading actually comes right before the first reading. Again, from the first Corinthians chapters, chapter 9, verses 16 through 17 and 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For I do this of my own will. I have a reward, but it is not of my own will. I am entrusted with the commission. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapters 1, verses 35 through 39. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he, Jesus, got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went out through Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. May God add, a, add truth and knowledge and love to this reading of the Holy Word. This week, a colleague and a friend of mine asked me, when did I first feel called to be a minister of God? And I may have shared this story with all of you before, but it's such a good story, I want to share it again this morning. I was about 13 years old, and my brother and I were living in the same bedroom. And as brothers do, we get into an argument over something or other. But as brothers do not necessarily do, that argument turned violent. Doors were broken, things were thrown around, and I was left beaten on the floor. Afterwards, I found myself curled up underneath a blanket on my bed. And I swear to you, to this day, I felt the bed move. I felt God's presence sit down on that bed. I heard in my soul that I was safe, that I was loved, that I was not worthless. I could feel God's touch upon me. But that, I realized as I talked to my friend, as I told her this, was only the beginning of my call. I truly did not understand at that time what it truly meant to hear the call of God. I was 13. I was 13. Before we continue, would you pray with me? Gracious God, help us hear and truly heed your call, not just as individuals, but as a community of faith. For so much distracts us and takes us away from your way. Guide us now, O God, and may the words from my lips and the meditations on all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Now, beloved, I share my truth this morning knowing that I did not actually follow my call right away. Like I said, I was 13 years old. And there were a few human examples that got in my way, shall we say. Some issues that... I had to deal with first. Issues that were blocking me from the love of God. And, and the first one, of course, and this is no recrimination on the Roman Catholic faith, but 
first issue was I was Roman Catholic at the time. And the human examples of priestly leadership in the 80s did not seem like God's love pouring out into my heart. So thankfully, I was able to walk away from, from that and continue my search, continue to find and understand what that call meant. Then, of course, there was the, the human examples I saw throughout our society, on TV, on commercials, by my parents, telling me that the only way to be a member, to be best, is to, how did I put it, to be a productive member of society. And that sounds wonderful, but it was that implied be a productive member of society alone. What does that mean? Well, it means get married and have two and a half kids. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to have a half kid yet. Or, or even yet, make money. Lots of money. And that didn't really feel like God's love pouring through the call I was feeling deep in my heart. But then there's this third way that the human example sort of caught me. And it did catch me for quite a few years. And I don't know where that human example came from. It may have come from a book I read. It may have come from a lot of things. But it was that draw, that desire to be a Renaissance man, to be a jack of all <coughs> trades, to be that person who is everything for Everyone. God, I wanted to be that. But as I sat there and followed this human example and got stopped, drawn away from the ministry that I was called to be, that God had put in my heart, that I felt God was put in my heart, I started to realize I was struggling through life. While I was learning all these different trades. All because I listened to that human example, which may have come from a book I read, like The Count of Monte Cristo. I love that book. <laughs> or it could, could have come from my siblings' expectations that I could always fix everything. Or, or it may have come from a Sunday morning worship service where a priest was reflecting on today's reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It could have come from there. Then again, it could have come from any of the apostles' writings, because let's be honest, Paul is pretty clear that he believes he is the perfect example of how we should all live if we are to follow and be a faithful member to God. He believes. <laughs> Today's reading from Paul seems to be that great example of this reality, as he is telling us quite clearly to become as the Jew, to become as one outside the law, to become weak. I have become, he says, all things to all people so that I may save some. Now, I personally admit that I may be a bit sensitive to this description of his calling, due to my own call story, due to the fact that it drew me away from being here with you now. I also may be a bit sensitive to this type of appropriation, shall we say, in today's age, because it seems a little abusive or colonizing in so many ways. You became as the Jew, as the weak, as the one outside the law? Hmm. Still, I think we can all witness that Paul is trying to exemplify his own deeds as the premier example of how one should be called. Which, by the way, is one of the main disagreements most people have with the Pauline letters. That Paul's language is often an ego-boosting, expressive rhetoric in order to create an example of false authority, a pattern of language that continues today 
amongst many public speakers, and I'm sure we can all think of one or two examples. <laughs> A pattern of language which implies the speaker's truth is right. Therefore, everyone else is wrong. A pattern of language that used, when used forceful enough, can shape people's lives and lead them away from their calling by telling us that making money or having kids or being productive for society alone is the only right way to live your life. Yet what people using this pattern of speech, and surely Paul forgets, is that we are all different. We all have different gifts and different calls. And Paul's gift is of being a slave to everyone else, of being everything to everyone, of being that evangelical preacher, is his gift. <coughs> but it is not necessarily anyone else's. And here lies the issue we see, the plague of our world, even today. That individuals like Paul do exist in this world. People who say this way or that way is the right way. Whether they are very clear in their limited view, or imply it within their language or speech pattern, or more often than not, are simply blind to the fact that other people exist. Mm -hmm. And that there is more than one path and more than one calling in this world. This reality, beloved, is the troubling side of only seeing humankind as our examples in this world. For people, even with the best of intentions, like I do believe that Paul has, I believe in my heart that Paul has the best of intentions, but even he can lead us away or astray from the calling that God has placed within your heart stream or within your heart's gap. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened if Jesus only listened to the cause of humankind. If he stayed in Copernicum to heal the people who were begging him to fulfill only what they saw as his calling, could you imagine what would have happened? Still, there is good news as well, for Paul doesn't just say that. He says just before that first reading that he came to proclaim the gospel. And that this is not a cause for celebration, it is simply what he is called to do. And that really, really is the good news. That he is called to that, and we are all called by God. Even our ex divine example in Christ Jesus, from the Gospel according to Mark, teaches this very truth. After he goes and prays to God, Jesus says, let us go to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. He teaches us that he is called to proclaim the gospel and implies that we are all called to do something. But our something is not the same as everybody else's something. That's right. In fact, I would be even believe that Jesus went out alone to pray because the people were expecting him to be all types of things to everyone. Yes, Jesus can heal, but that was not what he was called to do, nor send away demons, nor many of the other things that people crowded around him in Copernicum had expected of him. In truth, Jesus' mission here on earth could not be more clear. He proclaimed, came to proclaim the gospel, the good news. And yet, beloved, that may not be your calling. And you know what? That is okay. That is good, but that is not your calling. Nor may the calling that Paul teaches be your calling. 
I know it's not mine at this point in my life. You may not even know or fully understand what your calling is or how it will play out in this world, and how you are called to fulfill that calling. But that does not mean that God is not calling you. They are calling us, both individually and as a church. For us, this part of our identity is so much more important than we would like to think. For without knowing, truly knowing, what we are called to be as Jesus is, then we can easily be swayed into a calling that, well, we're really not meant to do. Like when I was trying to be everything to everybody. When I followed that path, I found my soul was not being fed. It felt like an uphill battle every day. So what would have happened if Jesus had stopped? If he had not stopped and not prayed that day <coughs> to hear his call, that call to proclaim the gospel, thankfully we'll never know. I can only imagine, though, we would have had this great healer in Copernicus. Would we have the Messiah? Would we have our teacher, our very guide in this life? That is the depth of what's at stake when we look at what is God, what God is calling us to do. We need to hear and heed that call. Even if the path forward is not very clear as of yet. So, beloved, what do you feel God is calling you to do? Do you feel called to preach, to teach, to gather new disciples? Or are you called to share God's love through ministries or mission of this church? Do you hear God calling you to sing? to welcome one another. Or maybe, maybe you just feel like God's calling you to sit in the pew. And that is okay, too. There are so many ways that God can be calling you, but it is for you to discern how that plays out. Equally important, though, is a larger question. What do we feel called to do? to be as a church, as a community of faith. Are we a community church? A mission and justice-minded church? A traditional church? Or are we an evangelical UCC church? An emerging church? These are the questions we must discern. We must discern who we have been and who we are called together to be now. These are the very answers we need to pray for. So when that call type of individual or that crowd shows up at our doors to tell us what the right way is for us to be as a church, as a community of individuals, we will already know what God is calling us to. For this discernment, beloved, for in this discernment, our discipleship will hold. It will hold steady as we hear, heed, and hear the call of God throughout our lives. May we all continue to pray for this epiphany within our discipleship, this epiphany of what God is calling us to personally, God is calling us to do as a church community of faith. God, grant your call upon us once again so we may all follow what we hear you are calling us to do, to become, and to be as your beloved children of God. Amen. I'd like to introduce or welcome those that feel called to sing today are quiet.
tell you, it amazes me more often than not what the choir brings. Because today we have this choir anthem about communion. And independently, we have a response. So let us sing our response to the choir as we all sing. Let us. Let us talents and tongues employ.
This table, though, is not mine, nor it is ours. It is Christ's table, which he opened for all people, no matter who they were, no matter what they, where they came from, or no matter what they had done in this world. This is the gift Christ brought to us, for all people, past, present, and future. Therefore, let it be known that this table truly is open to all people, all people and all of creation. Let us pray. Holy God, who loves us, who teaches us, who holds us, send your love wholly upon us now, upon the whole body of your beloved children, upon the wholeness of your holy creation. Let us feel the kingdom you and you alone have prepared for us, O God. Let this sacrament of communion be the holy example of your kingdom here on earth. Bless us with this gift, O God, so we may witness the glory of your kingdom, be guided by the spiritual example, and grow as your faithful disciples, welcoming and loving all people as our settlers, while we celebrate you, God, through this communion with you and your kingdom to come. The kingdom where all people and all of creation are welcome to be themselves free of fear, free of judgment, free of oppression. Grant these blessings, God, upon us so we may all witness and experience your Holy Spirit, which accepts each person equally through you. In you, God, we trust and pray that you will breathe out your Spirit once more upon your people throughout creation, so we may discover our beautiful and diverse differences as we embody the messages of love which Jesus exemplifies, reveals, and shares with the world. And upon these elements which transform our individual lives through the Holy Spirit into your one beloved fellowship, at one with you, God, and through you, with all of creation. In your love, we gratefully pray. Amen. Let us recall what happened on that night so long ago, though. For in the retelling, we relive what happened. Jesus called his disciples together, brought them, no matter who they were, be it Judas or Peter. He called them together, and before supper, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, God, as we do now, and broke it giving it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, poured out the, gr the grapes, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink, this is is my blood poured out for you. This is the cup of the new sacrament. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us now share these gifts together.
God, the bread of heaven. Please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, thank you for making us whole once more through this sacrament, for uniting us together as one just kingdom through your Holy Spirit, through the life and sacrifice of our Christ, your Son. In the celebration of this bread, this cup, we remember that you are the source of all hope, peace, joy, and the sources of life which the world cannot provide alone. In your holy name, we gratefully pray. Thanksgiving. 
first week, both studies, the uh, Wetland Book study, is on Tuesday nights, and that starts on the 20th, and the autobiography of our church starts on the 22nd on Thursdays. And that will be by Zoom, so it actually is even better. Five o'clock, both of them. Yes, there are sheets in the, in the entry. And Jan has an announcement. Who likes to go out to breakfast and have it cooked for them? <laughs> Who likes pancakes and sausage? Okay, Saturday, next Saturday, across the street at the parish house, we're cooking breakfast. Pancakes and sausage. We're doing our pancake flipping contest and we're having a rip roaring good time. Nine o'clock to ten thirty. Everybody's invited. Bring the children because we'll have an adult flipping contest and then the children get to flip pancakes and we'll see how many we drop. Okay? <laughs> Saturday, nine o'clock, come for breakfast. Cross the streets. Jan, gluten free. What? Gluten free. Well, and we have blue three pancakes too. Oh, yes. <laughs> and the last announcement I have is about Ash Wednesday. Uh, I'm still working on the details. We're, we're looking at maybe combining with uh, North Carolina, as we usually do, for some of our Easter service or our Easter services. So, more to come. Keep your eye out in the news and announcements during. Our leadership next week of music in the century. So we want We're worshiping in a beautiful way with music. We don't have to. As our closing hymn, let us join at number 571, Christ who call us all. <laughs>
people said. Amen. Amen.